Chapter Eleven, Section One of J. B. Burry's *The Student's Roman Empire*, Part One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. *The Student's Roman Empire*, Part One, by John Bagnall Burry. Chapter Eleven, Section One. Literature of the Augustan Age Latin Poetry Latin literature was affected seriously and in many ways by the fall of the Republic and the foundation of the Empire. The Augustan Age itself was brilliant, but after the Augustan Age literature rapidly declined. The most conspicuous figures in the world of letters under Augustus had outlived their youth under the Republic. Some of them had served on the losing side but these soon became reconciled to the new order of things. The emperor drew men to himself by virtue of the peace and security which he had established, cunctos dulcedine oti pelexit, and it was his special object to patronize men of literary talent and engage their services for the support of his policy. His efforts were successful. He won not only flattery but sympathy for the new age which he had inaugurated. He enlisted in his cause not only time-servers, but the finest spirits of the day. Although the Augustan literature is certainly marked by a vein of flattery to the court, and by a lack of republican independence, yet we cannot but recognize a genuine enthusiasm for the new age, for the peace which it had brought after the long civil wars, and for the greatness of the Roman Empire. And from a literary point of view, the Augustan age ranks among the most brilliant in the history of the world. Below the Periclean, perhaps below the Elizabethan, but certainly far above that of Louis the Fourteenth. It is true that the cessation of the political life of the Republic necessarily meant the decline of oratory. It is true that historians could no longer treat contemporary events with free and independent criticism. It is true, likewise, that the severe style of old Latin prose begins to degenerate, and that poetry lays aside its popular elements and becomes more strictly artificial. In fact, the poets deprecate popularity and despise the public. Horace's cry, Odi profanum vulgus et arceo, is characteristic of the age. But for literary excellence, and for the perfection of art, the best of the Augustan writers had a clear judgment and a delicate taste. The tendencies of the new age inevitably led to a decline, but as an ample compensation we have Virgil, Horace, Tibullus, Livy. Augustus, as we have said, concerned himself with the promotion of literary activity and the patronage of men of letters. He fostered in all ways the talents of his age. He founded two libraries, one in the portico of Octavia, the other at the temple of Apollo on the Palatine. He was an author himself, both in prose and verse. He wrote Exhortations to Philosophy, and a poem in hexameters entitled Cecilia. The Monumentum Ancyranum and the Breviarum Totius Imperi have been mentioned elsewhere. The two chief ministers of Augustus were authors likewise. Agrippa wrote memoirs of his own life, and edited an atlas of the world. Mecenas composed occasional poems of a light nature, and also wrote some prose works but he is more famous as a patron of poets than as a poet himself. His literary circle included Horace, Virgil, Varius, Tuca, Domitius Marsus, besides many lesser names. The orator M. Valerius Messala, 64 B.C. to 9 A.D., also drew round him a group of men of letters, among whom the most distinguished were the poets Tibullus, Valgius Rufus, Aemilius Masser, and perhaps Ovid. This circle seems to have held quite aloof from politics. Masala's own literary work chiefly consisted in translations from the Greek, both prose and verse. C. Asinius Polio, 75 B.C. to 5 A.D., held a unique position. Having been on the side of Antonius, he withdrew after Actium from political life, and holding himself aloof from the court, devoted himself to literature with a certain independence and perhaps antagonism to the spirit of the age. He was very learned, and a very severe critic. He wrote tragedies, which are praised by Virgil, and a history of the civil wars, Historiae, 
reaching from 60 to about 42 B.C. He was a friend of both Virgil and Horace. Publius Virgilius Maro was born in 70 B.C. at Andes, near Mantua. His rustic features bore testimony to his humble origin. His father was an artisan. He went to school at Cremona. Afterwards he studied at Medellanum, and finally at Rome, where Octavius, afterwards to be Caesar and Augustus, was his fellow-student in rhetoric. He studied philosophy under the Epicurean Ciro. After his return home, he and his family experienced the calamities of the civil war. Octavius Musa, who was appointed to carry out the distribution of land to veteran soldiers in the district of Carmona, transgressed the limits of that district, and encroached upon the neighboring territory of Mantua, 41 B.C. Virgil's father was among the sufferers, but Asinius Pollio, who was then legatus in Gallia Transpadana, and the poet Cornelius Gallus, interested themselves in his behalf. At their suggestion, Virgil betook himself to Rome, and obtained from Caesar the restitution of his father's farm. The first eclogue is an expression of gratitude to Caesar for this protection. Deus nobis hec otia fecit. But Virgil and his father were not permitted to remain long in possession of their recovered homestead. The same injustice was repeated a year or two later, and the poet was even in danger of his life. Again he went to Rome, and the influence of Messenus, to whom he had probably become known by the publication of some of his bucolics, secured him not restitution, but compensation, perhaps by a farm in Campania, where he spent much of his later life. Virgil's first work, the Bucolics, consisting of ten eclogae, or idols, was composed in the years 41 to 39 B.C. Inspired by Theocritus, they are written in the same meter, and are in great part imitations from his idols. But most of them contain references to contemporary persons and events, especially to the hardships in Transpadane Gaul, from which Virgil himself had suffered so sorely. Caesar, Cornelius Gallus, Alphenus Varus, the successor of Polio as Legatus, and above all Polio himself, have their places in the woods of Titerus. The fourth eclogue, written for the year of Polio's consulship, 40 B.C., treats a theme which hardly belongs to bucolic poetry. Virgil feels that he has to make his woods worthy of a consul. Si canimus silvas, silvae sint consule digne. He salutes the return of the Saturnian kingdoms and the Golden Age. The salutation was premature by ten years, and when peace at length came to the Roman world, Polio, instead of being its inaugurator, was rather an opponent. But it is interesting to observe that the idea of some great change for the better was in the air. The bucolics were written in the north of Italy, not yet Italy at that time. His next work was written in the south, chiefly at Naples. It was Messenus who suggested the subject of the Georgics, a didactic poem in hexameters, dealing with the various parts of a farmer's work. The first book treats of agriculture, the second of the plantation of trees, the third of the care of livestock, the fourth of bees. No subject was more congenial to Virgil's muse, his rustic muse, as he says himself, and from some points of view the Georgics may be regarded as his masterpiece. He has here achieved a task which is the hardest that a poet can undertake, to write true poetry in a didactic form. Rare artistic instinct and genuine love of his subject were happily joined to produce this unique poem, in which Virgil seems to be more truly himself than either in the Bucolics or the Aeneid. The composition and revision of this work occupied the years from 37 to 30 B.C., when it was read aloud to Caesar on his return from Actium. It is interesting to note that the latter part of the fourth book was originally devoted to the praises of the poet's friend Cornelius Gallus, but that after his execution, 27 B.C., this passage was cut out by the wish of the emperor and replaced by the story of Orpheus. In the Georgics, Virgil promises that he will soon gird himself to a greater task and sing the deeds of Caesar. But his poem took the form of an epic, in which not Caesar, but Aeneas, the founder of the Julian Gens, was the hero. The work was begun about 29 B.C., and occupied the remaining ten years of the poet's life. He died at Brundusium in 19 B.C., leaving the Aeneid unfinished. <laughs> 
His wishes were that the great manuscript should be burnt, but Augustus, that such a great work should not perish, committed its publication to Varius and Tuca, friends of Virgil, on the condition that they should make no alterations. Though Augustus was not the hero, there were opportunities, in a poem dealing with the origin of the Latin race and the Alban fathers and the walls of lofty Rome, to look forward over the ages of Roman history and celebrate the glories of him who was to found a golden age. The Aeneid has suffered from the premature death of its creator. It was neither finished nor revised. Yet it would hardly be an injustice to Virgil to say that its excellence and charm lie in particular episodes, in delicate and subtle details of language and rhythm, and not in the poem regarded as a whole. But it must always stand beside the Iliad and Odyssey as the third great epic of antiquity. The Roman dignity and magnitude of the subject, and the wonderful power of the narratives in the second, fourth, and sixth books, have exalted the Aeneid far above the Georgics in the estimation of posterity. Yet it might be argued that Virgil had more in common with Wordsworth than with Milton or with his worshipper Dante. The note of Virgil is natural piety. Perhaps he cannot be better described than by the happy expression which his friend Horace applied to him, anima candida. Virgil was buried close to Naples on the road to Puteoli, and the inscription on his tomb, said to have been dictated by himself before his death, ran thus, Mantua me genuit, calabri rapuere, tenet nunc parthenope, Cicini Pasqua Rura Tutses. In connection with Virgil, it is natural to mention his elder contemporary and friend, L. Varius Rufus, B.C. 74-14, to celebrated for his epics on Caesar and Octavian, and more celebrated for his tragedy, The Thiestes. Another poet of about the same age was Aemilius Masser of Verona, also a friend of Virgil, and disguised in the bucolics under the name of Mopsus. He wrote poems on natural history, Ornithogonia and Theriaca, but they have been less lucky than his models, the Greek poems of Nicander, which survive to the present day. The unfortunate Cornelius Gallus, 69 B.C. to 27, must also be mentioned here, though his name has its place rather in the age of Catullus and Cinna. It was he who transplanted the erotic elegy of the Alexandrian Greeks to Roman soil, and founded the school of Euphorion, to which Catullus and Cinna belonged. He translated Euphorion into Latin, and wrote four books of original elegies on his own mistress Cytheris, under the name of Lycoris. His death has already been noticed. The great lyric, like the great epic poet, of Rome, was of humble birth. Q. Horatius Flaccus was the son of a freedman, and was born at Venusia, on the borders of Apulia and Lucania, in 65 B.C. After the death of Julius Caesar, 44 B.C., he joined the cause of Brutus, and served under him in Asia and Macedonia, until the Battle of Philippi, 42 B.C. On that occasion he took part in the general flight, as he tells us himself, and afterwards returning to Rome obtained a post as a quasier's secretary. During the next ten years he wrote his satires and epodes, which brought him fame, and secured him the friendship of Virgil and Varius, who introduced him to Messenus. In 37 B.C. we find him accompanying Messenus on the journey to Brundusium, of which he has left us a pleasant description. The intimacy with Messenus ripened. The Epicurean views of life which both held were a bond between the poet and his patron. Horace had a taste for country life, and in 33 B.C. Messenus bestowed upon him a farm in the Sabina territory, which he preferred to royal Rome. Independence was one of the chief characteristics of Horace and he felt more independent in the country than in the immediate neighborhood of the court. The first book of the satires appeared about 35 B.C., the second book about five years later. In this style of composition the predecessor of Horace was Lucilius, but while Lucilius criticized persons and politics freely, Horace prudently confined himself to generalities on society and literature, owing to the altered circumstances of the time. Lucilius had imitated the Greek writers of old comedy, such as Cretinus and Aristophanes, and Horace stood in somewhat the same relation to his predecessor as the new comedy stood to the old. 
From these talks, sermones, as Horace calls them himself, written like those of Lucilius in hexameter verse and in colloquial style, we learn much about the personality of Horace and about his friends. In the Epodes, which were published about the same time as the second book of the Satires, Horace imitated Archilochus and attacked persons in coarse language. All these poems, except the last, are written in couplets consisting of a longer and a shorter line, generally an iambic trimeter followed by an iambic dimeter. They are the least interesting work of Horace, but they were a good exercise in handling meters and in the imitation of the Greek models, and they led to the odes. The greatest monument of poetry that Horace has bequeathed to posterity is the collection of lyrical poems in our books known as the Odes. The first three books were published in 24 B.C., the fourth eleven years later. In lyric composition he does not claim originality, he only adapted Aeolian song to Italian measures. But he claims priority. He was the first, except Catullus, to make the attempt Princeps Aeolium Carmen at Italos deduxis modus. For this he bids the muse crown him with Delphic laurel. But though the Greek lyric poets, especially Sappho and Alcaeus, were his models, it was an original idea on the part of Horace to turn away from the Alexandrian poets who were then in vogue, and go back to the older singers. It required true genius and wonderful artistic instinct to tune the borrowed lyre to the accents of another tongue. Horace was supremely successful. In the Odes his poetic judgment is, with few exceptions, faultless. The happiest word comes almost inevitably. His felicity, curiosa felicitas, was praised by Roman critics. Some of these poems are probably free translations from the Greek, but many refer to contemporary people and events. Some deal with Roman history, and the victories won under the auspices of Augustus. The fourth book of the Odes is said to have been published at the instance of the emperor. But in the interval between his earlier and later lyric works, Horace wrote epistles. The first book appeared about 20 B.C., after the strict technical constraints to which he had subjected himself in the Odes, it was a relaxation for the poet to expand himself in the easy and familiar style of the Sermones. But the urbane epistles, though written in the same colloquial language, are very different from the satires. They are more mature, less polemical, and they have a charm of serenity which is wanting in the earlier work. It might be said that if the genius of Virgil found its truest expression in the Georgics, so that of Horace was best expressed in his epistles, and in this form of composition he has never been equaled. The second book of the epistles, written in the later years of his life, includes a treatise on poetry, the Ars Poetica, in the form of a letter to his friends, the Pisos. Horace died in 8 B.C., surviving by a few months his benefactor Mecenes, beside whom he was buried. Though he had at first stood aloof, he became reconciled, as time went on, to the empire, was on good terms with Augustus, and did what was required of him as an Augustan poet. And independent though Horace was, he had a decided weakness for friendships with great people. The influence of Mecenas probably did much to stimulate his poetic activity, for Horace was by no means one of those who cannot help singing. He was not inspired. His poetry is marked by lucidity and judgment. Many poets whose works have not survived, but famous in their own day, are mentioned by Horace. His friend Valgius, who wrote epigrams and elegies, was actually compared to Homer. Aristius Fuscus and Fundanius composed dramas, Pupius doleful tragedies. Here may be mentioned also C. Melissus, who wrote a jest book, and originated the Fabula Trabeata, and Domitius Marsus, famous chiefly for his epigrams, in which field he was the predecessor and master of Marshall. Of the elegiac poets of this period whose works have come down to us, the most charming is Albius Tibullus, 54 to 19 B.C. Adopting the form of Alexandrian elegy, he breathed into it a fresh spirit of Italian country life. In his love poems to Delia, whose true name was Plania, there is a certain tender melancholy which we do not find in the rest of classical literature. By his deft handling of the pentameter he made an important technical advance in the development of Latin elegy, 
along with his works and under his name were published after his death some poems which were not by him but by a certain ligdamus perhaps a fictitious name also included in the collection of his elegies are some which were written by sulpicia the niece of his patron massala the umbrian poet sextus propertius probably born at assisium about forty nine to fifteen b c did not emancipate himself like Tibullus from the influence of his Alexandrian models, Callimachus and Philetus. On the contrary, he prides himself on his Alexandrianism, and calls himself the Roman Callimachus. He was very learned, and his elegies are full of obscure references to out-of-the-way myths. Nevertheless, no works of the age are so thoroughly impressed with the individuality of the writer as the passionate poems of Propertius. The passion which inspired his song was his love for Hostia, a beautiful and accomplished courtesan, whom he disguised under the name of Cynthia, as Catullus had disguised Clodia under Lesbia, and Tibullus Plania under Delia. His first book of elegies brought him fame, and probably secured him an admission into the circle of Mecenas. The imagination of Propertius was eccentric, his nature melancholic. He looked at things on their gloomy side, and perhaps his special charm is his skilfulness in suggesting vague possibilities of pain or terror. He loved the vague, both in thought and in expression. In his metaphors the image and the thing imaged often pass into each other, and the meaning becomes indistinct. He seems to have been a man of weak will, and this is reflected in his poetry. It has been noticed by those who have studied his language that he prefers to express feelings as possible rather than real. His thoughts naturally ran in the potential mood. His connection with Cynthia lasted for about five years, and after it was broken off, Propertius wrote little. It was Cynthia who had made him a great poet. The third of the great Roman elegiac poets, P. Ovidius Naso, of equestrian family, was born at Sulmo, in the Polygnian territory, 43 B.C. Trained in rhetoric and law, he entered upon an official career, and by the favor of Augustus received the Latus Clavus, and held some of the lower equestrian posts, such as Vigintiver and Decimver. But he gave his profession up for the sake of poetry. He has said himself, in a verse which probably suggested a familiar line of Pope, that verse-writing came to him by nature. Quid quid tentabam dicere versus erat. He is the only one of the great Augustan poets whose literary career belongs entirely to the Augustan age. His works may be classified in three periods. The extant works of the early period are all on amatory subjects and in elegiac verse. The Amores, in three books, celebrate Corinna. The Ars Amatoria, likewise in three books, give advice to lovers of both sexes as to the conducting of their love affairs, while the Remedia Amoris prescribes cures for a troublesome passion. But the best work of this period is the Heroides, a collection of imaginary letters of legendary heroines such as Penelope, Dido, Phaedra, to their lovers. Here Ovid has shown his poetic power at its best. The two works of the second period, the Metamorphosis and the Fasti, are the most ambitious of Ovid's works. They deal respectively with Greek and Roman mythology. For the Metamorphosis, or Transformations, composed in hexameter verse, Ovid obtained his material chiefly from the Alexandrian poets Nicander and Parthenius. The Fasti, a sort of commentary on the Roman calendar, in elegiac meter, should have consisted of twelve books, one for each month of the year, but only six, March to August, were completed. The third period begins with Ovid's banishment to Tomi in Scythia in 9 A.D., the cause of this banishment is one of those historical mysteries which can never be decided with certainty. The poet himself only ventures on dark hints. He mentions a poem and an error, Carmen et Error, as the two charges which led to his fate. He also said that his eyes were to blame, Cor noxia lumina fetzi. The poem probably refers to his licentious Ars Amatoria, which was so opposed in spirit to the attempts at social reform made by the framer of the Julian laws. But the true cause must have been the mysterious error. It has been conjectured with considerable probability that Ovid had witnessed some act of misconduct on the part of a member of the emperor's family, and was punished for not having prevented it, 
This may have been connected with the adultery of the younger Julia and de Silanus. The poet, perhaps, was made the scapegoat. In his exile on the shores of the Euxine, he composed the letters Ex Ponto, in four books, and the Tristia, in five books, in which he laments his fate and implores to be forgiven. The Ibis, a bitter attack on some anonymous enemy, on the model of a poem which Callimachus wrote against Apollonius of Rhodes, and an unfinished poem on fishing, Haliotica. He also wrote a Getic poem in honor of Augustus, but neither Augustus nor his successor Tiberius revoked the sentence of the unhappy poet, and Ovid died at Tomi in 17 A.D. In handling the elegiac meter, Ovid bound himself by stricter rules than his predecessors. He had wonderful facility in versification, but he was more of a rhetorician than a poet, and he is most successful where rhetoric tells, as in the Heroides. He lived in ease and luxury, and rejoiced that he lived in the age of Augustus, when life went smoothly. Hexetas moribus apta meis. His love poetry was distinguished by lubricity, and in this he contrasted unfavorably with Tibullus and Propertius. The tragedy of Medea, which he composed in his early period, is not extant. But it and Thyestes of Varius were the two illustrious tragedies of the day. Two poems, Nux and Elegy, and the Consolatio ad Liviam, were falsely ascribed to Ovid, but were probably written by some contemporary of inferior talent. Among the friends of Ovid, who were likewise poets, may be mentioned Sabinus, who wrote Answers to the Heroides, Ponticus, author of Thebaid, Cornelius Severus, who treated the Sicilian war with Sextus Pompeius in verse, the starry Albinovanus Pedo wrote a Theseid, and also an epic on contemporary history. The Georgics of Virgil and the Haliotics of Ovid belong to the kind of poetry known as didactic. Other works of this class are the Synegetica of Gratius on the art of hunting, and the Astronomica of Manilius in five books. Of the author of this astronomical poem we know nothing, even his name is uncertain, but he possessed poetical facility of no mean order and considerable originality. Most of the short occasional pieces, of a light and humorous nature, which were collected under the title of Priapeia, belong to the Augustan age, and many of them to the best poets. End of chapter 11, section 1. Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany, on March 4, 2009.